So thank you very much. Uh, I'm inviting speakers up now to join us for, and open up the conversation to the audience. Perhaps, if I may, ask the first question. Perhaps, perhaps that's the uh, chair's uh, prerogative as the lights come up, because I can't even see you in, anyway at the moment. But we, one, one of the things that we heard this morning, actually, from Andy was about the, the relationship between um, custom build and MMC. And I thought that would be a conversation to start us off on is you touched on it, how you're able to use those technologies to deliver placemaking, but how do you make sure that they are integrated with the cultural and local heritage? Um, you started talking about the adaptability of facades and stuff, but how far can that go? Mm. Perhaps Mark, start. Well, I'll have a crack at that. I think, I think I'm not sure that we have that answer nailed down yet. I think it's work in progress, and it's something that absolutely lies right at the heart of what we need and the industry as a whole needs to achieve if MMC and modularity is going to succeed. Japan have done it, Sekisui do it. So they've found a way of making you know, very bespoke houses super efficiently in, in modular forms. But they do have different zoning laws and different planning sort of inf uh, frameworks to, to, to what we do. So um, it, it's, a big, it's a big challenge, but at North Stowe, the, the Cambridgeshire project, we're working with Proctor and Matthews as the master planning architects, and then Shed Kem, who are designing our housing typologies. And it's about, it's, it's of course about uh, materiality, um, but it's, it is also about um, finding ways to arrange different typologies and having a sufficiently broad range of typologies that you can, you can assemble a place that isn't just a cookie cutter version. It's important to us that we don't, we, we want to beat the volume builders, we don't want to become them, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes. So, but it, so it is, I think, as I say, it's work in progress. We don't have a full answer to that, but it's very much at the top of our minds. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it is a tricky one. I mean, for you know, Marmalade Lane is built out of timber, and then there's a brick skin on the outside. So there's basically a second house right around every house. So, um, and you know, um, you can query the sustainability and the practicality of that, but it looks amazing. And so, you know, I think that there is a yeah, there is a tension there. Um, I think that it's partly a question you take about volume as well. I mean, I think it's absolutely right, and it's great that Urban Splash are almost like taking on the volume house builders on their territory. And certainly, I'm not down on volume house builders as a role there. Mm. Um, but I think that you know another way of broadening supply is actually have many, many more actors doing smaller projects. And I think I think that that's another way way to it. So I I don't know that it's necessarily critical to creating customised yet yet you know. Um, well integrated pieces of urbanism um, to have a kind of a you know a really big scaled up approach to absolutely everything but I do think we've got a long way to go in terms of understanding the relationship between kind of customization production planning um, there's a little anecdote I like to tell about Marmalade Lane where um, I mean the planning authority was by and large reasonably supportive um, but we said on the customization front we said we'd like to let people choose their brick from a palette of four and uh, Planning authority went, mm, not sure about that. Mm. Just submit all the potential variations to us and we'll, we'll take a look at it. So it was basically, the number of variations was four to the power of 26, which I don't quite know. <laughs> so we decided that in the end, rather than do that, we would just let some people take the ones they wanted and, and then we would do the rest. And so that, that was an example of where I think that like the, even though there was a will behind the project, like the culture really hadn't caught up. And I still think that there's a kind of a, uh, a, a bit of a disconnect between what's possible and what people out there want and what the system is capable of, of dealing with at the moment. See. Yeah, we've, um, on the current development we've got in uh, for planning permission in uh, Chobham, uh, we went for a sort of balance of, we're going for wood panels uh, and we've got a guy on the team, Doug, and he just won't let anything go by if it's not sustainable construction materials. and. Uh, so we're looking for to a passive house level as well. So we've got a, a balance of the architects, Wall Thistleton, have really worked to look at the local, to, to look at the vernacular and make it fit in well. Um, in, and so we've got the panels and then the architects have specified, really, and, and the community that we're working with are saying, we like it. In fact, it is so amazing. I want to live there. Um, and that's saying something. Uh, and then in terms of the customization, we've just mainly made it about the in interior. So the span is enough that you can have different number of bedrooms, although we're not sure how the local authority are going to respond to that, or you can have a hugely open plan downstairs, um, but, but 
if you don't want that and you want it sectioned off or you want a downstairs bath, you know, a bigger downstairs bathroom or something, you could have that. So that's the sort of balance we're going for. Thank you. OK, so uh, questions from the audience. So if I, if I take one here and one here and then we'll take them together. Thank you. How do you overcome the problem outside those areas where you have congenial landowners and planning authorities with the reduction in the building standard for environmental performance and the inability of local authorities to require passive house standards via their development plans? So it's a question about um, innovation and, and spread rather than the projects you've worked on. Great question. And then we take... Uh, one of the speakers this morning um, referred to the growing proportion of elderly people in the, the housing chain. Um, and um, it, I, I'm someone in my... My wife and I both in our early 60s. One child left home. The other child... Or the one hopefully will leave home soon. Uh, living in our... <laughs> four bed detached with a nice bedroom so ideally there should be something here to make us trade down there's nothing I've seen today that would make me want to move into any of the houses I've seen now I appreciate bungalow is a dirty word but perhaps single story dwelling but um, something like the patio houses that um, Jorn Utzen did in Denmark in the 1960s would be the sort of thing that appeal that could be high density but single story dwellings uh, with controlled uh, views, so people have the privacy, the sort of privacy we might have in our own garden at the moment. But I, I can't see how you're going to persuade people like me to move into high-density flats, Two great honest. questions. Environmental performance and ageing population. Uh, Sue, yeah. Um, is Jenny here? Jenny Barker? She's definitely, there she is. I mean, I think it's a responsibility, it's something that where the planning authority can take a lead... And that's something that Jenny did, and I'm just wondering if Jenny can answer your question. But is that really putting you on the spot, Jenny, about that one? Um, yes, I, I worked on North West Bristol, which was, uh, came out of the government's Ecotown programme and was the only site that continued to Ecotown standards. And we uh, did rely on the PPS we had and embedding that in local policy as well. But I think it is really challenging and uh, certainly... We have looked at how we increase standards across the board, across the district, and we're still having that debate as we move to sort of joint spatial strategy in Oxfordshire about what level of um, control we might have and what standards we might be able to um, require. So I think there's, there's something on standards, and then I think there's also something on housing mix and how you actually achieve that as well, and whether or not we've got enough knowledge to have a sort of sophisticated policy that deals with more than just affordable housing need, which is calculated in a sort of standard way. And are you, I mean, is it okay if I answer that oh, one yes. as well? <laughs> um, so on, on our uh, the shopping development that I mentioned, um, we look, we've got some two-bedroom ground floor apartments which we think which will go straight out onto the open space with a big community garden and some food growing and sort of smaller gardens for the homes generally and more community space, which for me is very attractive as I've traded down with all my children leaving home. Um, so I think it can be done and I think there's some very interesting potential innovative models out there like the Mutual Home Ownership Society model as well, uh, where if you're trading down and you've got a bit of extra equity, I think there might be some innovative financial things that could be done where the, uh, you keep your money in and maybe you can take a bit of rent uh, for another home in the development. So like the whole community owns as a housing trust and then you're living there and you've paid for your house but there's a bit of change left over so you can collect some rent to help with your income uh, in your old age, maybe. But that's the sort of thing I'd love to look into a bit more. But there's Leeds Lilac as an example of mutual home ownership. Yeah, so both Neil and Mark, actually, Neil, you talked about passive house to standards and how you're delivering yeah. that. So Marble Lane Lane is close to passive house. It's actually, as it happens, pretty close to the passive house low energy building standard, which is slightly less stringent in terms of the, um, the energy use. And I think there is, incidentally, a legitimate question about whether if you were to mandate, you know, if we were playing Fantasy League environmental standards, whether passive house is the right mm. level. Um, because I'm not sure that, you know, saying that you should achieve every possible f fabric uh, gain before you start thinking about how you supply energy is correct. Um, so we will generally try to aim for the passive house low energy building standard, which, you know, I think is 35 uh, kilowatt hours per square metre per annum is the, the demand figure. 
um, because we think that's about right. And after that, you start kicking into you know very high uh, marginal costs for each for each bit of saving. Others might take a different view. But I think the answer is it's just rules. There should be rules. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I made this point earlier. You know, our whole problem with our planning system is you can game the system on viability grounds. And until very recently, you know, it was all about making sure the landowner got the surplus they needed. The change in the NPPF to EUV plus as a basis for valuing land is a positive change, albeit one that I think has not really been factored through yet. Um, and will leave certain projects, including some we're involved in, in, in you know, potentially in some difficulty when it goes through. But we'll go through that. But I think, you know, fundamentally there should be rules you should not be able to game the system and then everyone can move forward in a in a stable way and I think that applies as much to affordable housing as it does to environmental yeah. things on the point about um, downshifting it's interesting because obviously we're in a you're I don't want to speculate on your age sir but you know you're, you're in an you're, yeah, yeah, I thought so. I was, I was thinking that, but um, obviously people in the older generation now are in quite a unique position because actually they're living longer, but they're also probably the last generation for whom having a big house that doesn't have every bedroom occupied would be a luxury that they that they have. So I, I'm personally not convinced we should be building the built environment for what is you know for a temporal uh, a temporal kind of issue. But what I would say is, for example, at Marmalade Lane, we have built a three-storey building of large two-bedroom, uh, uh, you know, apartments with high ceilings and inboard balconies and big shared areas. They're mostly occupied by downshifting uh, older couples or singles who've released big properties elsewhere in the city or in the county, um, and it works absolutely fantastically. They're deck access. We've broken loads of rules about how you should and shouldn't design deck access, same as we've broken all sorts of rules about fronts and backs elsewhere, and because it's co-housing, it works really well. So I, I think it is tough, actually, to do bungalows, personally. <laughs> um, I think there is a, there is a land use efficiency land. point, yeah. you know, about that. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, in the end, if I were you, I would also say that a lot of things that are positive for older people are, are, are not up to snuff. So I just think we have to provide better uh, options for, for people generally, and that is an issue of design across the board. Mm -hmm. Uh, it'd be good to extend the point about the negotiation as process as well. Perhaps you could say a bit more about that, uh, Mark, about the, the negotiation that's done at the planning stage. And, and, and yeah, well, I suppose I was, I was going to make the point that I think what can we do as developers to address your point? We can do the exemplar project. We can show that it can be done. And we have, all three of us in our different ways, done things that there's a lot to be admired about. Not, none of them are probably perfect. But it's... It's, that's the key thing that we can do, and then it's about the system, and it's you lobbying, and it's our politicians taking on the fact that it's, the house is burning. You know, we've got to do something about it, but we, we can't actually enforce it. We can't make, you know, apart from in our democratic roles, but what we can do is show, here's something where it has been done, it works. I mean, Mikhail Riches' project in uh, Norwich is a fantastic example, passive house, affordable, uh, uh, 96 homes, I think, and built uh, 180 pounds a square uh, foot. I mean, that's incredible. It's super, and it's a beautiful piece of townscape and placemaking as well. So it can be done. It is being done. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, that's our role. And then shouting about it, getting it out through these forums and you all saying, oh, you should go and see that. It's brilliant. And yeah. Go on, very quickly, uh, right, please quick raise your hands as well for the next question. I, I plug also for the Older wo Ouch, the Older Women's Housing Co-op, which is a great project where a group of older women designed uh, a retirement community for themselves, very much based around co-housing. So we've got one question over here. And one, yeah. Oh, I was thinking that something about Greeks bearing gifts today, you know. Um, and But I was really going back to something that, that David showed when he showed the... Um, uh, the, the, the Corb plan for Paris. I always thought that was a, a, a polemic when you read Corb, and I'm, I'm a Corb fan, but, but one of the things I wanted to say is there was a period in the 50s and 60s when the best architects and the best planners were doing the worst schemes ever. You know, I think of Holford, a number that I, I don't want to mention, but nice guys, um, and, and, but they were still crappy schemes. Um, and, 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 but, but the thing is, some people think we're entering a similar phase now. 
discuss. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> John Best from Milton Keynes. Uh, I think the Pecha Kucha approach worked really well, uh, and I like the sort of the instability and the edge to it for the presenters. Uh, I'm I'm left with a, a conclusion from the, from that sequence of do nothing dull or predictable. Um, and, and let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, we're all here to try and make some sense of um, uh, and coherence within the Oxford to Cambridge arc, uh, in which the million pound target is totally arbitrary, and as we heard this morning, the planning process and system is entirely unpredictable. Um, should we be trying to get some sort of master plan in which to plant all these wonderful a uh, thousand uh, plants blooming, or, and does it matter that we won't get a master plan of any sort? Two quite related questions, and predictability, uh, how do you do a master plan which then enables under unpredictability as well within it? Uh, let's start, Neil, go yeah, for it. Um, we, I had the privilege of working with David Rudlin on an entry for the National Infrastructure Commission competition on typologies, which Velocity won. And we just spent the first kind of couple of workshops just wrestling with the sheer, you know, it's basically if you build a series of Milton Keynes's, but at kind of Oxford and Cambridge densities, you still need, like, by the time you've taken out, you know, the floodplain, the AONB, the Greenbelt, you're basically left with, you know, you've basically got to build a city of 500,000 people at Steeple Claydon and Calvert, and then just basically a series of other, um, you know, smaller extensions and settlements. It's an absolutely huge endeavour. It cannot be done without you know, development corporation and then some. And so this idea of like locally led and funded off kind of the future proceeds of housing is all just can. You know, it needs a massive public program of massive planning infrastructure. And I think that provided that's done in a learning from what's successful, you know, from what we heard from, um, from Rotterdam and we know of the way that, say, Vinax Towns or Copenhagen's expansion have been done, which is, which is that, you know, you zone land, you master plan it, and then you subdivide it. And in the subdivision process, you need to try and make sure that there's enough urban splashes and towns and the countless other smaller developers who want to do good things. And you just give them a series of blocks and you go, here's the code and go and do your thing. You know, so I think that's actually the answer. And I think that slightly addresses, hopefully, this issue about quality. Because in the end, unless you basically don't believe in perimeter blocks as a means of laying out cities and stuff, which personally I do as the kind of default, then, you know, you're never going to get bad development if you basically go for a street block plot approach and build a city around it and denser at the middle and less dense at the edge and high road buildings and really good civic architecture. And then away you go, you've got a town. And, you know, you're never going to do a million houses that way in 20 years without basically a kind of war effort level of, of, of top-down, but with bottom-up involvement, kind of massive planning, and that's what it needs, in my view. Very good. Uh... Make him in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on a similar theme, isn't it? We're yeah. responding to these challenges. Does it need a warlike strategy? Sue? Yes, it does. And uh, it's all, as I said at the beginning, it's all got to be zero carbon, sustainable, responding to the local housing need, not just churning out things that will sell to people that are moving out from London. Um, so I think there's something of an experience that I had on the Ecotowns Challenge panel, uh, which was people were coming forward and chancing their arm with all sorts of sites. But just the idea to, like you say, if you've already looked into it and you can see this is where we need the development, I think that's a really good thing to start with, to, to actually think where would it be the right place, especially from a sustainability yeah. point of view with regard to transport. transport yeah. Because if people are out on a limb down the end of some farm somewhere, they're just going to have to rely on a car and that's just shooting ourselves in the foot completely. And that was the point we made very strongly this morning, wasn't yeah. it, Mark? Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say, I think you're probably, uh, well, uh, positioned to answer this as well, <laughs> but because of velocity or velocity or how, because that was a really interesting set of proposals about how, how do you achieve lots of smaller, but, you know, sustainably transport-linked um, settlements that also have the, the chance of being locally responsive and specific. Because I think that's the other thing is, you're right that, frankly, if you're going to build a million homes, it needs that absolutely top-down war effort approach. But with our democratic system as it is, you know, you're not going to get those consents unless there is some degree of opportunity for people to to shape it and like it. And you know, and that, we should be we should be creating those places that are, um, you know, 
familiar and attractive and, and sort of lovable. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I, I mean, the point, the point about, um, sorry, just to answer that question, now I've been invited, but the, the velocity was, uh, you know, connecting to transport. I think we know what we need to do, but it was, it's the stakeholders and the collaboration, I think, yeah. that needs to come forward as part of that uh, master plan process as well that brings in people like the Wildlife Trust, CPRE, communities... Anyway, so, sorry, I was going to say, I think there's, with um, companies having to dive, uh, pension companies and investment funds having to divest out of fossil fuels, they're looking for things to invest mm. in. So I think yeah. if we could come up with a prospectus for the Oxford Cambridge Arc and perhaps uh, some sort of development corporation with a, a sort of a price tag and a, and a big sort of master plan that nevertheless did invite in the entrepreneurship of the smaller developers. Mm, yeah. I think there might be people who would want to invest in such a thing because presumably there's returns that are going to come from this. And it's bricks, you know, it's bricks, well, not and bricks and mortar, it's, it's wood long, panels and modern methods of construction. But it's long, <laughs> long horizon investment yeah. returns, which is what yeah. those, those yeah, pension yeah. funds need, yeah. Can I offer again contributions from the floor? I mean, I'd be particularly interested. I know there's some larger house builders here, uh, their reflections on what we're hearing as part of the plan panel discussion, perhaps. <laughs> so, question down here. Just, just a quick question from the large house builder. It's not my probably personal question. How do we... Irina Meriwether. Um, sorry, a lot of stuff here. Group of an urban designer from Taylor Wimpy. And my mission is exactly to make sure that Taylor Wimpy moves forward with regards to placemaking, some of the modular approach we are already looking at in our new house, housing typologies, etc. But we've undertaken uh, post-occupancy post -occupancy placemaking research with our customers across the country, and the top problem came parking issue. Now, it's all very well talking about just, just the, the Cambridge, the Marmalade Lane, the infills, etc., but so many of our developments are on edges, in the middle of nowhere, completely unsupported by any opportunities for public transport, facilities, etc. We try and make a great effort to introduce facilities on site, but nevertheless, parking causes the most issues, and even with the provision currently, people are not happy. How do we change that? Just so. <laughs> There's a very telling question. I can see people <laughs> bursting to answer. Uh, uh, let's go down the line. Um, yeah, it's 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 almost like you, it's kind of I wouldn't start from here is the mm. is the answer on parking. I mean, the reality is we have to start having a dialogue with people about what the you know about what dependency on the car does to their environment. It, it does to their air quality. It does to the planet. And we can take the internal combustion engine out, but actually half the particles that are congesting our lungs are from tyre wear and other things that won't be addressed by that. Um, but in the end, fundamentally, the, the problem with the car is the severance and the and the kind of place movement clash it creates and the land it takes up and all the rest of it and it's it shouldn't be the job in my view a big house builder to lead a dialogue about how we have more compact more sustainable cities you know i don't blame uh, house builders for for um for not doing that however the the business is kind of predicated on that model being the only model that's there and i know that everyone in you know in london they do something different or in a an urban brownfield site they do something different but the the prevailing model of essentially an estate off a spine road with one road in and one road out and often cycleways and all the rest of it but fundamentally it is built around a car dependent lifestyle that is something that i think voluntarily they could do a lot more about and part of our argument is as soon as you start you know if you build at 40 dwellings a hectare you give everyone two car parking spaces 30 percent of your land use excluding the streets assuming you don't put it underground will be car storage you know that's a that's a totally wasteful land use and it's always struck me that someone must come along with a kind of speculative model that basically goes hang on a second we can make a shed load more money if we just have an intelligent structured dialogue with people about you know what the what the trade-offs are between this and green space and all, and all the rest of it so I, I, you know, we've all got the compunction to do it, but I just think that it's that thing of, you know, if you give people what they want, they'll always say parking. So actually engagement isn't about giving, it's not about giving people what they want. It's about leading them in a structured way because we know stuff about things um, to understand what happens if everyone lived like they do or they, they purport to want to do. And that's what sustainability is. It's about thinking about how the world would be if we all lived the way that we do and, and maybe we should live differently. So, 
you know, I, I, I'm at great pain not to blame people who build houses that we all need for this, but we're all part of the problem and we have to get back to a different form of frame of reference for people, I think. Just responsive to what the local authority totally, yeah, do, yeah. Uh, provides yeah. on their parking standards, etc., yeah. etc. But also, yeah. we are dependent on the public transport provision, sure. etc. So it's very, very difficult. So, yeah. And so many of our schemes built to the PPG three <laughs> template yeah. completely don't work currently in the current situation. So there is an issue there, and I'm just looking for ways of changing the culture from within and looking for answers. I, I'm all for reduction in car usage. So do you want to say something about where land is in relation I, to yeah, infrastructure? I, yeah. I, I think there is this question, which just came up in the last round of questions, really, of if we're going to build a million homes in this arc, let's make sure they're, you know, densifying existing, you know, look at the infrastructure there is here. Densifying Milton Keynes is talked about as a thing, you know, it's yes. A very interesting diagram that David was showing in earlier on, the, the kind of traditional cities in Milton Keynes, two kilometres. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, interesting. That's the answer, isn't it? Yeah. So there's something, a beautiful moment there about how local authorities and developers could sit down and have a cup of tea, and like you said, Mat Mattis, and, you know, and work out a new way rather than being bureaucratic about it and sort of going also, through these processes. There's also this thing about speculation of land and where land yeah. values are low. Yeah. Do you want to say maybe a bit more about that, Mark, and how that is influencing where people invest uh, that you know ends up in places which are disconnected from mm. infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, or not, or something different. <laughs> if you can't answer that one, <laughs> I mean, inevitably, land and land ownership and and um, who profits from development is is such a key part of this, and I think that that uh, that is such a huge political um, kind of um, time bomb because you know there are people who sit on land and and um, and it's not that it's not necessarily the volume builders it's the, the landowners who then sell options and they they're just creating they're just getting a a huge slice of value. For frankly nothing, you know, they haven't done anything active. They just they just own that land. So, so it's you know, I think, but but that is that is all of our wealth. Lots of pension funds yeah. own land, you know. So it's actually when you start to unravel it the and system, unpick it, it's yeah. it's a huge thing. But if you could take that slice out of the, or, or at least reduce the amount of profit that is just taken out of any appraisal when the moment that that land gets planning or exchanges a sale, then, you know, it's... But, yeah, that's a, that's a huge, <laughs> huge question. <laughs> I just wondered, does anyone know a, a better planning system than the one we've got that actually works? <laughs> well, <laughs> well we I, I, I think that, uh, obviously, I've asked a couple of really quick, tricky questions which ends up in sort of academic theses, and I'm also <laughs> being told that we're run, running oh. out of time and need to get to our coffee break. <laughs> But I, I mean, I'd like to thank our panelists, but just before I do, I think what's come out of the conversation actually, and the conversations across this morning actually, a real appetite to inform a spatial proposition for the Oxford Cambridge corridor that does enable better quality of life. And I think the Academy of Urbanism and others are all coming up with statements about what this should be, that the benefit of getting those groups together to come up with an alternative plan or to work with government to deliver it, I think would be something good to come out of this conversation today. And with that, I'd like you to join me in thanking our three Petra Kutcher panellists, Mark C. Yeah.